burn hole. I am a deputy U.S. Marshal, Boyd Givens, right now. The infamous Boyd Crowder. Either you let me go, or I'm gonna have to give you the slip. I love this shit. This shit makes me hard. You just happen to be driving by, huh? No, I put a motion detector in. Last I checked, you were a marshal too. And as a lawman, I'm suspended. And then you go all railing on him and drag him out of some I restaurant by his nutsack. They underestimate me at their peril. Him? People underestimate Bob at their peril. I got mad ninja skills, buddy. Yeah, you know karate. And two other Japanese words. There is one thing I wander back to. We dug coal together. Hello, and welcome to After Further Review. Today, we're going to get into Justified City Primeval, Episode 5. And as always, with anything that is associated with Justified, we are again joined by the hardest working man in new media, Mr. Rick Morris. Rick, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thank you. Great to be here. Uh, it's the chocolate and peanut butter coming together, AFR with Jones and the FDH Lounge. Now, before we jump into this, we are going to talk about Episode 5, and we're going to do so quickly, but... Uh, before I do that, I would like to make a direct message to Hulu. You guys have been around for like a decade. And I have refused to pay the service fee for a streaming service that requires me to watch commercials. It is what it is. Now, it took Justified and Shorzy to bring me to the other side. I have had this service for all of what is this now? Four weeks, maybe, at the most. You guys got to do something about this run up 13 error code. Because now, I cannot watch Justified, no matter what I do, <laughs> on Hulu. Which is very, very frustrating because it's quite literally the only reason I have the service. So please, anybody from Hulu that's watching, figure it out. Anyway. On to episode five. That was your best read from Letter Kenny. Figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so the the first point we've got to get to right out of the gate, because it had me cackling, immediately channeling an old Chappelle show bit. Just do me a favor, okay? Don't tell anybody about this. From the makers of the love contract comes the confidentiality agreement. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm not going to tell anybody. I know you won't. Or I'll sue your ass. <laughs> Kobe! Rick, I had no idea that in 2023 there were uh, post-coitus ground rules that needed to be gone over. So this never happened. So don't tell everyone at school. I just want to lay some ground rules. Of course. Nothing changes between us. Nope. My client is still my client. Yep. That said, how was it for you? It was about what I expected it to be. To, to harken back to past conversations here, I don't know if that's necessarily the case, but perhaps society has evolved there by 2027. There's almost, there's almost one of these every, every episode, and when I say episode, I mean our show here. Yes. There is almost always the, the pull on the leash that says, remember, it's 2027. Uh, that whole thing was awkward, right? And then, like, the whole, like, so how was it? <laughs> right. But then, you know, then it gets even weirder. Like, Raylan is being kind of complimentary, but she has her guard up. And don't get me wrong, I understand. Right. Uh, we, live in a, you know, we live in a different time than my parents grew up in. Um, right. But, like, I understand her being on the defensive, but that whole scene was realistic. It's not, I'm not making any comment about acting or, or directing choices. They just did a really good job of selling that that was just kind of awkward. Yeah, and as far as her having her guard up, I, I think it would have been more, quote-unquote, justified if his change of clothes would have included a T-shirt that said, Catch Criminals, Not Feelings. But he wasn't wearing that, Jason. Yeah. Now, this whole awkward sort of morning after is only made more awkward when we have, yet again, 
another very small character that just oozes justified from before. Yeah. How many times is Raylan, Deputy U.S. Marshal, in an official capacity going to come across someone where he says, hey, so who are you? And they refuse to answer the question. Right. You remember the, the gardener guy and I think it was season one? There's, there's yeah. some stuff going on. Raylan shows up and the guy's like, oh, I'll take care of the cowboy. And he goes out and Raylan's like, yeah, who are you? And he's just like, the gardener. I'm not saying it's a staple or maybe it's just how Raylan composes himself against the superficial or surface level meeting of a bad guy. But he seems to draw the kind of response that says, I'm not answering your question. And this happened with Jamal. As soon as he leaves to go get coffee for he and Carolyn, Jamal just shows up. Right. Trying to, once again, another, you know, male ego kind of a thing, I guess. Just a man walked out of his ex-wife's place, and now he's got to dig his heels in. And that's the thing, too. I know from your show notes that uh, you were kind of looking at the Jamal angle here and wondering a little bit, and I kind of am as well, because it's a thing where it's it's a relatively complicated canvas, but it doesn't feel overloaded. But you throw this character in there, and the question might sort of be, to what end? And that's where, outside of Justified Season 5, I don't know that we had too many times where there were characters where it was like, do we really need... Remember, like, the Crow family had, like, one or two extra brothers where it was just like, do, do we really need this guy? And it's yeah. like, that's the feeling I think we're both getting about Jamal so far. That being said, this show, outside of perhaps Season 5, but they've almost always figured out a way that even if they're doing something like that, there's a payoff in the end. So I get the sense that this guy in the last three episodes is going to be a lot more important than we think he is. That so, he's, he's going to show up somewhere along the line. He's going to maybe try and insert himself into one of these schemes. That this is going to be something where I think that's going to be the case. Because if it's not the case, and again, these three episodes are in the can, so it's too late for them to change it upon listening to us, but he may go down as a wasted character if he's not very, very significant. Because just as Caroline's ex-husband, it's a miss if that's all he is. Yeah, and this this brings us up to a, an interesting segue, but before we get there, pardon my uh, faux pas here, is Jamal Dickey Bennett... Ooh. Ooh. Uh, now, we don't, we don't have to fit everybody into a justified original run box, but... Okay. It's a character that isn't a major player who's going to kind of come in and out. Yeah. Who might ultimately meet a less than ideal situation. I don't I don't expect Jamal to die like Dickie does. No, not necessarily. But I do think you're you're really tiptoeing around something here where Jamal either serves as just one other factor that pushes Carolyn to a certain place, and we'll get to that later in the show, Mm -hmm. or to the point you just made, he's going to find his way into some crosshairs of these other storylines that are happening, and then the question becomes, if that were to happen, how how is Carolyn affected by that? How does that affect the other players involved. So I do feel like a show like this doesn't introduce him right. unless there's something to it. Like, there's no way possible that this is the last we've seen of him, right? Right. The question then becomes, is he just a straw that may have contributed to breaking the camel's back of Carolyn, or is he going to be more of an active role or obstacle down the road? Right. And Caroline, after tonight, five episodes in, so we are five-eighths of the way through this some bitch. I don't know that we even, after episodes one and two, we talked about her a good amount. We thought that she could be pivotal. She could be setting up as the pivotal uh, player based on the way that the episode turned out tonight because 
this was, and I said to you off air, this was before the episode started, I said, I'm just going to be curious to see here because it's too early for it to feel like the beginning even of the end game, but we're past, as we said last week, we're past the universe building. The, the last traces of universe building were episode three. Episode four was an episode that had a lot of action to it. This is one of these things where, again, the tempo kind of resets a lot of times on projects like this. This was the quiet, relatively speaking, sort of episode where it's the character development. And you're seeing things play out and the conversations and, and what it kind of glimpses of what's to come. And Caroline having conversations with a number of folks along the way, uh, certainly with uh, Jamal, uh, with Sweetie, with uh, not with her client at any point in time here, but certainly Raylan. And you were get, you're getting a sense that, again, she's very much in play. She could go either way on this kind of a thing. And this is one of these things where, if I'm going to make comparisons on characters, there have been ones where Raylan has hoped, I think, in the past, that somebody was going to make a better choice than what they eventually end up making. And I feel like that's what she's going to be. So I don't know if she's going to be completely quite like a tragic character, uh, you know, like Raylan's aunt or anything like that. But there have been times where he hopes over the course uh, of events here that somebody will, will, will end up doing the right thing in the end, making the right choice. And the fact that she's feeling this very strong lure of becoming a judge, this is the thing that could be her undoing and the thing that leads her down that path and makes her legally irredeemable in the eyes of Raylan, and perhaps worse than that, maybe she doesn't survive this. So it, she really, really feels like she's the pendulum right now that could decide the way this thing swings and how happy an ending this might be in the end as far as redemption for some of the characters on the board. And I was going to save this for later, but let's do it now. Okay. We see towards, and we're jumping ahead, but we see at the towards the end of the episode... After she meets with Jamal. And that does not go well. She takes off. Right? And then she meets up with Sweetie to talk about the book. And we're going to get to some of this stuff later. But there's just this one little nugget I want to leave. There was something that we talked about on the first... The double feature that we did on one and two of this Primeval ep uh, series. And we mentioned that Raylan has had some decisions where, and this even came up in last week's episode, where there is a sense that Raylan has to be a U.S. Marshal in every sort of way when he's on duty and whatnot. Then we got into a side conversation about what happens when he puts his badge away or when he's suspended, right? And then that leads into this idea that Raylan has some gray areas. But as we found out in the original run, one of those gray areas just did not sit with Artwell at all. Almost to the point where it feels like Raylan's character didn't understand why he was so bent out of shape. We see Carolyn, figuratively speaking looking down a road I would prefer she didn't look down. If her goal is to become a judge, there absolutely is a wrong way to get there. And I'm very afraid that with everything going on in her life, it's going to push her to potentially, like you said, make a decision that would not be the decision Raylan would hope they would make. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, it would be an interesting dynamic to see Raylan react to Carolyn the way Art reacted to Raylan. Great point. Great point. And I mean, sometimes, <laughs> listen, disappointment can be a chain of things here. And you're absolutely right, because Art did on a few different occasions feel disappointment with, with Raylan, but nothing ever held a candle to the, the time of the Nikki Augustine murder and Raylan's culpability in it. You going to give me trouble about doing what I have to do? If Nicky would chosen to turn himself in, I'd have taken him in. But he decided to go another way. So if you saw a crime committed against him, you wouldn't, as a lawman, feel the obligation to intervene? I'm suspended. That was the thing where 
Uh, and, and again, to this day, I mean, if, 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 if they were to do a, a, a nugget in the next episode or two where Raylan's having a conversation with somebody and he mentions that my old boss, and that's a shame, you know, he died before we could ever kind of talk about this thing that happened between us. We wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Because you don't know if that was ever okay in there. Now, the fact that you did get the sense late in season five that Raylan playing a role in uh, bringing down the Crow family here and avenging what happened to Art, that that might have in some way sort of mended fences. But yeah, that's a thing where, again, Raylan on a number of different occasions has done that and, and has, again, sort of exerted this sense of expectation towards folks who are, uh, I, I would say, sort of crime adjacent, okay. more or less, as, as this lawyer is. Certainly a little bit with uh, with Loretta over a period of time and the sort of paternal interest he took in her, which as, as in thinking back on it now is a very interesting precursor to him being a parent because some of the same exasperation we saw with her back in the day, uh, you know, like, you better not use this money to go get Van Halen to play at your school dance, you know, that kind of stuff, kind of a precursor to the stuff with his daughter. Another thing here, too, uh, and I, I don't need anybody casting aspersions for me bringing up uh, another uh, minority person in the same regard, but the person it feels the most like, as far as the way he looks at Caroline, is Limehouse. He was always wanting Limehouse to flip on some of the, the, the crime-adjacent people, right? Because Limehouse, his hands weren't necessarily completely clean, but Limehouse wasn't so much a criminal as criminal-adjacent. Limehouse is Grand Cayman. Yes. Just, just the idea that, yes, he does business with people who are criminal adjacent, let's say. Shady AF. Yeah. Uh, but then, it's it, Limehouse also has uh, a little bit of Winston. This is You're not going to get this reference. Uh, okay. But Winston is the guy that runs the Continental Hotel in the John Wick series. Okay. And this Continental Hotel has one rule that you cannot break, and that is no business on company grounds. The business... Okay is the business of assassins. So you can't spill blood on the continental grounds, right? right? Yet, you will find a situation where John Wick, our good guy, is facing off with his immediate bad guy. Jonathan, listen to me. A man can stay here a long time and never eat the same meal twice. Jonathan, just walk away. Yeah, Jonathan. Walk away. What have you done? Finished it. In the Continental, and the whole thing is like, no blood is spilled. Well, you're the one that let him in here. <laughs> you know? It's like, you can't have these these bad guys right. in your midst, and then, you know, you're, you're Switzerland all of a sudden. Right. Um, so, yeah, in some sense, I always felt like He's the broker of the bad guys, but then if you're in his territory, he's he's going to say, no, 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 none of that here. Right. Well, you're the one that's entertaining the bad guys. <laughs> At some point, something's going to give it, it down the road. So I, I, I love the, the Limehouse comparison um, because that may absolutely be what it is. Yeah, is. I'm just very fearful of a person who aspires to be a judge that does good work, does the right work, if she gets there by less than legal means. Well, and, and that's an interesting thing here, because when we're talking about this era of prestige TV, what I'm going to loop in here uh, is a show that I had watched that I enjoyed. I would say it's a poor man's Breaking Bad, and that being Your Honor on Showtime, two-season uh, deal with Brian Cranston playing a judge who he's not somebody that comes into it being corrupted. It's his son, right? Yeah, his son accidentally kills the son of a mobster in, in a car crash, and then Brian Cranston then becomes corrupted, trying to cover it up, and then it's just a number of other things that have to happen in the course of protecting his son, but it then becomes... He's still trying to be ostensibly a good man, a good judge, yeah. bring justice to the courtroom and all the matters that don't involve this. So 
that's sort of like Caroline's story in reverse, basically, because he got there and then had this happen and it started unraveling. She's going to come in with the unraveling behind her, and best case scenario, she builds the kind of career that Brian Cranston's character, Michael Desiato, had prior to all of this, which again, neither you nor I see happening. It's not like she's going to get in there, happy ending through redemption. That's not how redemption comes, again, especially in, say it with me, the justified universe. It doesn't happen here. And by the way, too, when we talk about what would uh, what would Elmore do as, as far as Elmore Leonard, I thought I caught a name on the credits here tonight, and I did. Peter Leonard, himself an author, son of Elmore, who is on the creative team for the project, one of the executive producers. Yeah, I was going to so say, I, I could have sworn I had seen him listed as a producer. Yes, yes. And by the way, and I mentioned this to you off air, another tie into the entire thing here, I'm trying to think back to, I think it was season three, one of the, the, the subplot where I think uh, one of the guys in protective custody was snitching, I guess, to try to, uh, and, and I think he was putting the marshals at risk. And uh, Karen Sisko, I think, came in oh, okay. uh, for one of the things here. Karen Sisko being from another line of Elmore Leonard uh, creations. And actually, there's a, there's a movie with her character, Out of Sight, and this detective Raymond Cruz, who is in Justified City Primeval, is a crossover character from this Out of Sight movie, which I'm going to go look this up now. This is a 1998 movie. I've seen it. Have you? How is it? It fits in line with many sort of action-driven 90s movies. Okay. Um... I don't know why the Peacemaker is jumping out in my mind, but... And that's okay. the Peacemaker with Nicole Kidman, not the one with John yeah. Cena. Yes. Um, um, I remember thinking it was decent. Like, I, I definitely wouldn't say it's something you got to go out of your way to watch. Uh, but, you know, if it's on cable, it might be worth it. And you would have watched that at the time, it yeah. being an Elmer Leonard movie, and, and not having any idea of no. how interesting you would come to be subsequently with Elmore Leonard Gus uh, projects here. So I am was, I'm I'm still see. blown away when I see like I'll see something that mm-hmm. I'm familiar with or I've seen before or I thought about seeing and then I'll read that it's it actually is derived from a Leonard Elmore yeah book or something. Yeah. And I will literally I'll have that moment where like shut up. Yeah. Get out of my face with that. Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. By the time I had known who he was with Justified, I I had no idea that his works had been sort of spread around. And over the last two decades, if not three. This is where I want to read his stuff, too. I've never actually read any of his works. And you you throw other stuff into the the, the whole thing here. If we're talking about the wider Elmore verse, uh, you're going to, like, get Shorty and then uh, whatever the sequel was with The Rock in the 2000s. It's not only characters, perhaps, from the justified mothership that we may find ourselves comparing uh, things to, but other characters as well. And again, knowing that this uh, Detective Raymond Cruz comes from one of these other stories, I suppose in that way should not be surprising. And I don't know if the other story was set in Detroit or not, but I, I know you've had some thoughts here about you know the Detroit way and, and what that might have been lifted from, and if another city might be filing for gimmick and print <laughs> yeah. right about now. I should be able to quote this word for word, and it's just okay. been a while since I've seen that one episode, so I may fumble it. Uh, but there is a, a scene in the West Wing. You're scared of Babish. Oh, like you're not. No, because we are both men of Chicago. What is it with people from Chicago that they're so happy to have been born there? I meet so many people who can't wait to tell me they're from Chicago, and when I meet them, they're living anywhere but Chicago. You wouldn't understand. Which plays off of the Chicago way. Now, the Chicago mm-hmm. way that I was thinking when I sent that was going back to the Untouchables. I don't know why the Untouchables keeps coming up, but okay. it goes back to the Untouchables. What are you prepared to do? Everything within the law. And then what are you prepared to do? If you open the ball on these people, Mr. Nash, you must be prepared to go all the way. Because they won't give up the fight until one of you is dead. I want to get Capone. I don't know how to get him. Want to get Capone? Here's how you get him. He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. When I heard 
uh, Detective Wendell saying, mm -hmm. or we could do it the Detroit way, my immediate thought was Chicago just heard that and is pissed. Well, <laughs> you just tried to take their, 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 their whole city identity is based on the Chicago way. Yes, and uh, Norbert also uh, was talking about the, the Detroit yep. way in past episodes here as well. And it's a thing where, of course, the Chicago way at its most elemental level refers to this is an either or both kind of a thing. So we're either talking the mob, we're talking political corruption, or most most likely where they intertwine. Yeah, I was going to say how they're married together, sure. Yes, yes, as with the daily political machine, 1960, uh, finding the votes in the graveyard for JFK, allegedly. So <laughs> this is how things basically kind of operate. And that's the thing where here in Detroit, they're using it in the same sort of sense of basically, I think this whole sort of hardened real politique of we're going to do what we got to do. And if it means maybe we got to plant some evidence, maybe we got to do this, we got to do that, whatever it takes. And it's one of these things where I think Raylan went from earlier in the episode tonight to looking at it and, and being ready to kind of walk away at that point and just, you know, get back to his daughter and think about this too. He really, really had to start grappling with the moral responsibility of letting this monster on the loose here. That uh, if Clement goes out there uh, and, and again, just, you know, causes more bloodshed and chaos and everything like that, is he going to live with it because it's a thing where he knows he can take him down? As arrogant as it is, he knows that. He knows that he has the opportunity to take him down if he applies himself the right way, works with the right people in the right capacities. He can get this guy. He's done it before. We've talked about this before, whether it be finding and bringing in Drew Thompson, uh, whether it be bringing in uh, uh, Boyd, as he did at the end of uh, Justified the mothership, I guess we would call it. He's done this before. He can get this guy. He can't walk away. Because, and, and that, that seemed to be sort of a subplot of tonight's episode was a deal of like, how much can you live with? Because yeah. I think for Caroline, this is what it goes to here. She wants to be a judge. There's trade offs that are going to have to be made if that's the case. And these trade offs may end up uh, further kind of uh, uh, propping up uh, Clement in the end here. She may need him to get what she wants. It may be difficult to uh, bring him to justice as, as well as getting what she wants out of this thing here, too. Sweetie, it's been an ongoing thing going back to the first episode here. What can he live with on these things here? So we're getting into the moral trade-off, so we're getting to where it's more of an interesting, introspective kind of an episode. And these are ones that... I think Justified City Primeval probably for the most part has a pretty hardcore fan base. And I think it's one that like, if, if you're in this, if you're in for the ride, you know what you're getting. And it's one of those things where I think people are gonna ride with this over the course of an eight episode series. We will in all likelihood look back at this one as the slowest and most character driven episode out of the bunch here. And as I said before, it's necessary. You have to kind of shift the pace back and forth Staying on the throttle the last five episodes of the season like they did in the final season is very rare. It really is. We, we talked at the time, that felt like a five-part finale. Yeah, You don't necessarily get that. This was like a tone shifter. It gives us a look inside the heads of some of the key characters. The next three episodes, I think the shiznit starts getting real. No, I definitely agree with that. Uh, and I, I, We were talking just before we started. 